welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another very special edition of History Hack. Special in that it's me and Kit running this one for the first time ever. So Kit, how, hi, how you doing mate? I'm doing very well. How are you? This is kind of a strange situation because we've got Alina with us as well and our guest today, who I will introduce in a moment. But we've got four Second World War historians here, and I don't think the Venn diagrams even match up once. Uh, you know, you're doing your, your, your boaty stuff. Alina is doing Warsaw Uprising in Auschwitz. My PhD is in Manhattan Project. And our guest today is James Holland household name in World War II with titles of the Battle of Britain, the War in the West, Sicily 43, Burma 44. And he's here to talk about his new book, The Savage Storm, The Battle for Italy in 1943. Uh, he's also, of course, the co-host of the We Have Ways of Making You Talk podcast and the We Have Ways Festival, which I hear went really, really well. Uh, yeah, no, it was, a, it was a, a thank you for having me on, by the way. It was a lot of fun and it was great to see Alina there. And it was a, a bit too hot, which is, you know, it sounds like a sort of whinging, a whinging Englishman, but it was really hot. I, I don't know what's going on with the weather, but, you know, wet all August and July, had loads of cricket matches cancelled. And then suddenly, you know, just as the cricket season ends, it goes absolutely scorcho. But apart from that, it was fantastic. It was a really good atmosphere and we had great people come and amazing talkers and fun stuff and serious stuff and lots of hardware and too much beer and all those kind of things. So it was a lot of fun. I loved it. The Arsenal, of course, was extortionately hot. I think I was I was the second speaker on on the Friday, and uh, the guys that used the fan at the time, and there's me standing, just just going through with it. Do you know what? When you're speaking, you've just got to ignore everything that's going on around you. Just deal with the situation. So I was just kind of like bollocks to this. I'm getting on with it, and I had a really, really, really good time, and I loved it. And everybody was so nice. And it was good fun. So thank you so much for well, inviting me and Alex and, and the wow, rest. Wow, great to see you there. I mean, where you are absolutely right is that everyone who does come is is absolutely lovely. I mean, they're just so into it. It's 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 so nice to see. And everyone's very friendly and excited and sort of kids in sweet shops and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's um yeah, it's, it's, it's a bizarre weekend, but it's a lot of fun. Well, people got an exclusive with you actually at the we have ways and i'm going to kick this off i'm going to kick off all of these questions and then the guys are going to take over because i'm a tiny bit out of my depth in this i'm going to be honest i really am and they know much more than i do and they can make a much better of a showman of this podcast than i will so i'm going to stick with the first question which is what was the state of the mediterranean campaign following the capture of sicily in august 1943 well the state of the mediterranean campaign is that you've got Italy on the brink of leaving the war. And everyone knows that Mussolini's kicked out from within on the 25th of July, 1943. So that is, you know, just after two weeks after the invasion. And on the 17th of August, you know, the Allies completely take over the whole of the whole of Italy. The last Germans managed to withdraw across the Straits of Messina. And so suddenly the Allies have got this toehold in Italy, albeit one that's on an island rather than on sort of mainland of Europe. And you've got a situation where you've got Italian troops um, garrisoning most of the Balkans, much of Greece, much of the Aegean. And there's obviously a kind of, you know, it would be a good idea to get rid of them. Th there are definite benefits of going into Italy, sort of hustle Italy out of the war. If Italy does go out of the war, then that's an awful lot of territory that Italian troops are currently looking after, which the Germans will either have to abandon or fill themselves and you know you can't just magic up these troops these troops have got to come from somewhere else so you know presumably the eastern front or the western front the absolute number one priority for the for the western allies by this point is going to be operation overlord which has now got its name um, and this is a cross-channel invasion of um uh from from britain to normandy which is at this point due to take place in may 1944 not june 1944 and that's the number one priority so anything that can that can can improve the chances of um a successful landing in Normandy has got to be taken with two hands. 
And so that's the, that's one of the reasons for wanting Italy out of the war as quickly as possible, because that means the Italian, the Germans are going to have to fill the vacant holes left by the departing Italians, which is obviously, you know, a fairly big commitment to the tune of about 50 divisions, which is, you know, a huge amount when you think that Britain only ever has 53 divisions in the entire war. So so it's a, it's a, it's a large commitment. Um, and so there's very good reasons for doing that. The problem they've got is that they don't have enough shipping. And that sounds crazy, really, when you think about the kind of huge shipyards in America and not, you know, also, it has to be said, in, in Britain as well. There's this huge spree of building landing craft, assault craft, between April 1942 and May 1943, which then comes to an abrupt halt because they've made 8,700 of them. And they suddenly think, well, that's enough and we need to go back to making other types of shipping. So the the huge boost in assault shipping, which they suddenly realise they're going to need in the Pacific and Southeast Asia and and for Normandy um, and also in the Mediterranean, that's now come to a halt. And it's just they just don't have enough for for the huge global reach that the Allies are now committed to. They don't have enough of anything. And Italy is is a you know it's a nice bonus rather than a, the main event. So the main event by this stage, although. The war against Japan is supposed to be the second, you know, is supposed to come second and, and Germany first, dealing with Germany first. It's very much on sort of a parallel tack by this point, and it's certainly primary um, for the US Navy and a major commitment from the British as well in Southeast Asia. So, you know, these are the challenges. And a lot of the sh- a lot of the, the of, of the huge number of, of of landing craft, and we're talking about 1,700 of them, which were available for Operation Husky, the invasion of Sicily, are no longer available. They've been earmarked to go elsewhere to the Pacific or to go back to Britain. They also need a major overhaul because, you know, these ships are really, really roughly made. And actually, I was on a Higgins boat um, not very long ago, just the other day. And, and you know, they're super simple. Um, and they require, you know, they have engines and you're expecting them to do a lot of like, a lot of things. You know, you're charging towards the shore, ramp comes down. You know, the opportunities for damage and, and bashing them around are really, really high. So you can't just keep using them and using them. And of course, these landing craft are not just, it's not just the ramp coming down, everyone pouring off onto the beach. It's over and over and over again, repeatedly for, for weeks at a time until that campaign's over, because until you've got enough ports, you've got to still use beaches. And so these landing craft get absolutely abused. And the number available for operations in Italy is is a fraction of what it was. So I think it's, um, it's 700 and some six, uh, what is it? I can't remember, it was like 600 or something for Operation Avalanche, which is the agreed plan to land Fifth Army south of Naples at a place called Salerno. And there's only 268 available for, for Montgomery and his Eighth Army's plan to get across the Straits of Messina into the toe of Italy. And 268 sounds like a lot, and it's a hell of a lot when you're looking at them all lined up in the port, but it, it really is nothing when you think that an infantry division requires 3,000 vehicles. And it's not just getting those vehicles across, it's then maintaining the effort, you know, with subsequent follows up of food and rations and, you know, ammunition and more men and more guns and more ammunition and all the rest of it. So, you know, when when your entire aggressive operations are uh, amphibious, landing craft are absolutely everything. And if you don't have enough of them, you've got a problem on the hand. Whereas the Italian and the German problems and challenges are are of a different nature but maybe i need to just draw breath i want to laugh away before somebody jumps in because i love it thank you you make my day jones thank you all right i'm going to jump in because um i'll admit italy is the campaign that brought me into the second world war um i yeah i I know it's it's not really the one that anyone looks at but it's the one i'm fascinated with and everyone always talks about monte casino and uh, anzio and all kinds of things like that but your book covers so much more. Uh, and we really begin with Operation Baytown, which I think most people probably aren't familiar with. So tell us all about it. Yeah, so so Operation Baytown is right in the toe. Um, you know, it's literally the toenail of the big toe. And um, it's a hop and a skip across the Straits of Messina. It's literally, you know, it's a, a mile and a bit at its narrowest and, you know, a few miles um at as a sort of widest point of the cro- of the crossings but all monty can or uh, montgomery is still commander of the eighth army at this stage all he can do is is send over two divisions so he sends over the british fifth division and canadian first and obviously there are lots more divisions in eighth army but it, it, again it goes back to shipping capacity there's just not enough to sustain it and the other point thing is there's not a huge amount of point going into 
going to that point of, of Italy because it's just mountains down there and there's incredibly narrow roads. And the and the roads, the road network for the most part in Italy is designed for horse and cart and the odd sort of fit Topolino or something. But, but it's certainly not it's not suited for kind of a division of three thousand vehicles and lots of trucks and tanks. You know, it's just not what it's suited to do. And also the other thing is is the road network that does exist um involves lots of bridges and tunnels and, and perilous overhangs <laughs> over chasms and whatnot because that's the nature of driving roads through mountainous terrain and if you're the retreating 29th panzer grenadier division um they're unspeakably easy to blow up <laughs> so <laughs> so the british are coming in and the canadians going in don't don't just have to kind of get lots of vehicles over and ammunition and rations and all the rest of it they also have to bring over lots of engineers and with them bridging equipment and bulldozers and cranes and everything else so very quickly it starts to turn into a sort of massive massive headache but this was conceived in the first place just as a sort of drawing off of troops and away from the main effort which is going to be operation avalanche and the trouble with operation avalanche again it goes back to something is is there isn't a lot of shipping and the idea is it's going to happen kind of um six days later um, so on the 9th of September, so Baytown operates on the, is on the 9th. And it really is just a kind of sort of foray in strength. And they have very little oppo- opposition. So um, all the Italian troops there just sort of, you know, throw their hands up and are only too happy to be greeted by the, by the Allies because for them the war is over and that's all they're interested in. The Germans are retreating and blowing everything up. So the idea is, is it's supposed to be the kind of sort of the, the kind of support act before the main event happens. But Avalanche has been given the go ahead for this six day later on the 9th of, of September. And the idea from the Allies is, is and also I should say on the same day that Baytown is launched, the morning of the 3rd of, of September. So the anniversary, the fourth anniversary of the start of the war from Britain's point of view and France's point of view. That afternoon is when the the armistice is signed between the Italians. So 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 point one of Allied aims has been achieved already. The moment, you know, within a matter of hours of of the first Allied troops landing on the toe of toe of Italy, which That's is obviously better than awesome. D Day, isn't it? Yeah, 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 exactly. And so obviously the Germans are going. You know, they're not going to abandon the Balkans and the, the Greece and the and the Aegean or indeed Italy. Although there is a big question mark over how much of Italy they occupy. And the original plan for the Germans is to uh, retreat to what's called the Pisa Rimini line, which will later be known as the Gothic line. And this is about 200 miles north of Rome. Uh, and it makes very good sense in many ways, because there your lines of supply are, are, are shorter. Um, you can do a kind of sort of very tenuous fighting retreat up the leg, but not, you know, not make too much of an effort about it, which will buy you time. Um, and and up there, the Alps are kind of, you know, the Apennines rather are, are pretty impregnable and they really do run, you know, the mountains really do run from one side of the coast to the other. So there's very good reasons for doing that. Um, and that means that you can you can consolidate there while you can then occupy the Balkans and Greece and all the rest of it. And to be perfectly honest, while while the Allies have been kind of umming and ahhing about the very nature of, of the invasion of Italy and, and what scale they do it and how much they invest in it, because there was also talks of just going into Sardinia and things like that and Corsica and not bothering with the mainland. What the Germans are thinking about is what do we do once the Italians go out of the war, which they're inevitably going to do. And so they come up with these plans to completely disarm the Italian armed services and indeed do exactly what the Allies expect them to do, which is flood all these areas around the around the Mediterranean with the northern north eastern Mediterranean with with German troops. And those do indeed come from the Western Front and from the Eastern Front. So, but you know, by the by the time the sun goes down on the 3rd of September 1943, two of the Allied aims have already been fulfilled, which you would have to say is a pretty big tick in the right box. But, uh, and it's a fairly big but, the Allies have got a bit carried away. And what they've decided is what they really want to do is do this full-scale invasion because what they really want are the airfields at Foggia. And Foggia is about three fifths of the way down the down the leg of Italy, or two thirds roughly. And it's on one of the rare flat bits of land. There's this huge plain surrounded by mountains, but there's this big enough plain where you can have a complex of airfields. 
And at those airfields, you can house heavy strategic bombers, four-engine bombers. And from there, you can continue to tighten the noose around Nazi Germany from a strategic air campaign. And this is particularly important because, yet again, it all goes back to Operation Overlord and the need to secure air superiority over the whole of Northwest Europe before you launch it. And the reason you need to do this is because the moment you land, you need to slow down the enemy's ability to reinforce the bridgehead around Normandy. And the way you do that is by destroying bridges and marshalling yards and railway network and their own lines of supply. And the way you do that is by bombing very accurately at low level. And you can only do that if you have command of the airspace. But the problem is, is that's great. And destroying the Luftwaffe or, or seriously hampering the Luftwaffe is, is, is number one priority for the strategic air forces and particularly the American air forces who are operating by day, operating out of Britain. The problem is, is most of the aircraft industry is deep in the Reich and beyond fighter cover. And they can't get there without getting slaughtered. So having strategic air bases in southern Italy is really, really good news because it means they can attack the Germans' only source of real oil in Plosti and Romania from there. And they can also attack aircraft factories in the southern Reich in, in sort of you know southern Germany and, and in Austria. So it's a massive tick. And it is really the airfield, the prospect of getting Foggia, which is what drives the plans for Italy from something very, very small scale and sort of, you know, a bit of a dibble dabble in Sardinia and in the tow into a major full scale invasion, uh, which is what comes to fruition with plans for, for Avalanche. If I'm not mistaken, isn't this where some of the bombers, uh, sorry, not just bombers, but some of the uh, airlift is happening in 1944 heading towards Warsaw during the Warsaw Uprising? Yes, completely. 100%. So they do use this. But, but, but the problem is, is if you're going to go and get Foggia, you need a big enough commitment to be able to secure it. And then you need enough shipping to be able to get and, and sustain a significant number of bomb groups. And in fact, what becomes very quickly from the 1st of November onwards in 1943, the first, the, the 15th Air Force, which is a strategic heavy bomber air force running alongside the 8th Air Force, which is obviously operating out of out of UK. And you can't have everything, you know. If you if you haven't got enough shipping, you can't you can't supply your frontline troops, and support what originally planned to be six bomb groups operating out of Foggia, but which, because of mission creep, grows to twenty one bomb groups by March nineteen forty four, and that is one of the big issues with the Italian campaign. They're always trying to do too much with too little, whereas in Normandy, for example, you know. It is a land of plenty, and and the Allied forces are given the full weight. So, you know, you would not find infantry battalions operating in Normandy for more than about four to six days max in the front line. I mean, it, it's double that in Italy for battalions in Italy because there's just there aren't the replacements, there isn't supplies to support that kind of rotation of troops. So by going into Italy on a large scale but still not large enough, you're committing lots of people to having a very, very, very difficult time. And, and you know, it's based on the principle, you know, these decisions to go into Italy in a big way and, and launch Operation Avalanche, for example, which is the main effort, is still a main effort at a fraction of the scale of Operation Husky, where they no longer have to contend with the Italians. They're just contending with Germans, whereas in Husky, they only had two German divisions to deal with. They've got at least seven within the area of Salerno. Or, or, you know, within spitting distance, with easy reinforcement. And they're also assuming, based on very, very spurious intelligence earlier in the year, that Hitler is going to retreat to the Pisa Rimini line. And this has been reinforced by one of the Italians who's doing the armistice negotiations, a guy called uh, um, uh, General Castelloni, who says, yes, 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 this is absolutely the case. The Germans are intending to move to the Pisa Rimini line. But those are, you know, as the Allies have, should have known by now, Hitler's constantly changing his mind. And, and what he says in May 1943 doesn't mean, say, he's going to keep it in September 1943. So the assumptions on which they're going are, are really pretty dodgy, to say the very least. And you're also hearing it, you know, and that's reinforced from the say-so of, a, of an Italian who's desperate to get out of the war and desperate for the Allies to invade. So can you trust him? Now, as, as it happens, Hitler does still intend to go to the to the um, Pisa Rimini line and his intention and check this out. This is just unbelievable. His intention, he was getting fed up with the, with what the Italians were doing. Are they in the war? Are they out of the war? What are they going to do? 
He his plan is on the 9th of September 1943 to give an ultimatum to the Italians. And the ultimatum is this: right, you can look after southern Italy. We're buggering off to the Pisa Rimini line, and we're going to have priority on everything in the north of the country, which is where the industry is. And you can suck that up, you know, and that's just how it's going to be. He's presented it as a fait accompli. But of course, Operation Avalanche is launched on the 9th of September. So that plan gets kicked into the long grass. It never happens. Had the Allies delayed their invasion. The Germans would have already been on their way up to the Pisa Rimini line, and a lot of a lot of aggro and heartache and death and destruction could have been avoided. But you know, that's the way it is. But my point is, the Allies are are, are basing their assumptions of for avalanche, the invasion, the, the main main evasion, which is due to happen on the 9th of September, on German intelligence, which is faulty to say the very least. And then the plan is that the Italians will support their operations by not succumbing to the Germans and, if necessary, turning their guns on the Germans. And that 100% does not happen. <laughs> you know, so, so there are German high command, um, Italian high commanders, see, I'm including um, a, guy called, a guy called um, General Giacomo Carboni, who is the head of the Italian Secret um, Intelligence Service, SIM, and also the head of the Armoured Corps, which is protecting Rome, which probably has the best, has the Piave and the Reti um, divisions, which are probably the two best in the in the, in the Allied, um, in the Italian army. And his suggestion is to send out a message to all the senior Italian commanders around Greece, Balkans, Northern Italy, all the rest of it, called OP44, which is saying the moment the armistice is signed, if the Germans are aggressive, attack them, and. All his seniors, the seniors at the, you know, Ambrosio, who is the command, head of the Commando Supremo, which is the, you know, chiefs of staff, and Badoglio, who is the prime minister, um, and, and Rowata, who is the, char in the uh, man in charge of the, um, of the Italian army, all go, yes, 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 what a good idea. But they have no intention of issuing this at all. And in fact, they don't. They, um, they issue Operation Order 24202, um, which actually says exactly the opposite, which says, whatever you do, um, do not open fire on the Germans. <laughs> so quite the opposite happens. So Avalanche is being launched by the Allies without enough shipping, with a fraction of the support that they, they're offering, something like Husky, which is a main event, you know, the invasion of Sicily, against an opposition which is potentially stronger on, on, on assumptions which are not going to prove the case, either in terms of the Italians or the Germans. And to say it's a high-risk strategy is... This is just a, an understatement of gargantuan proportions. But fortunately, they pull it off. Uh, we were going to ask a little bit about Operation Slapstick and the Germans trying to defend the ports. But all of this is sort of going on at the same time as other things when we've got Salerno coming in very quickly as well. So what's what's happening to sort of counter all of this movement from the Germans, the Italians swapping sides, everything going on at once? Well, so so the Germans can see the invasion fleet coming coming across from Sicily, so they know it's coming, and they're all assuming that it's going to probably be in the kind of Naples area because of the restrictions of 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 um, uh, of, of air power and and the range. You know, you need you know if you're doing an amphibious invasion, you absolutely need to have domination of the skies over the invasion front, and you know, coming from Sicily and all that, you know, it's a hell of a long way to Salerno. It's even further to to Naples, and it's and it's out of the question going all the way to Rome. So interestingly, both Kesselring, who, who is a who is the commander in chief of, of the army forces in the south at this point, Army Group C, um, and his other senior commanders all kind of are worried about Rome, uh, which makes no sense whatsoever, because as an airman, you know, but, but Kesselring is a is a Luftwaffe field marshal, even though he's now the overall commander in chief down there. You know, he should have known that that would be just impossible. But but anyway, but but there is an assumption that it's going to be they're going to land around the Naples area. And in the area of of, um, of Salerno, they've got the 16th Panzer Division. And there's these various other divisions in the areas and, are, and around about, all of which you can be pulled off. And they've also got to deal with the Italians around Rome. But that's all over by the afternoon of the 10th of, July, uh, 10th of September. So then the, the, you know, the 3rd Panzer Grenadier Division, for example, which has been involved in the Battle for Rome, can now be hurriedly sent south. So very quick order, you know, by the by the evening of the of the twelfth of September, three days after after um Avalanche is launched, Germans can call on six divisions sort of either there or homing in on Salerno against just four Allied divisions which have been landed. 
you know, so the situation looks very, very perilous for the Allies. But this concentration around Salerno comes at a, comes at a price, and the price is Apulia, and Apulia is the southeastern end of Italy, which is only held by the first Faustenjäger division, the first German first parachute division. And some of the Faustenjäger division units have also been siphoned off to give a bit of backbone to some of the other units, like Twenty Six Panzer and. 29th Panzer Grenadier Division, which are uh, and this was the, the same unit. Sorry, this was the same unit that landed in Crete, wasn't it, and got absolutely decimated? And was that yeah, yeah? But they've you know they've rebuilt and stuff, and they've been also been dropped into um into Sicily and stuff. So they've been operating in Sicily, you know, further kind of reboosted again, but then still not back at full strength. But they're considered to be the elite, and and I suppose they're volunteers and stuff, and they are all German rather than you know, Czechs and Poles and, and, and what have you. Um, whereas, the twenty, you know, most of the others in in, in a lot of the other divisions that have been, uh, that are now in Italy have been, they're what I call Phoenix divisions. They're, they're, they're reborn um, divisions out of the fire of complete defeat at Stalingrad, for example. So, you know, 16th Panzer was completely rebuilt um, and so on and so forth. So what Kesselring agrees with von Weitinghoff, who is a 10th Army commander, um, is that they're going to abandon Apulia. So, so you know, as we've already discussed, Foggia is one of the, you know, main main targets for the Allies in invading Italy in the first place. But, you know, the Falschmig, it can't be everywhere. So they do, you know, a few demolitions and a few booby traps and this kind of stuff, blow up every bridge they can, but kind of hurry back. And what this means is that the Allies can get into Taranto and Brindisi and Bari, the three big ports in the south, pretty easily. Even better, they can get into Taranto, which is a huge port and had been kind of one of the major bases of the Italian Navy, without landing craft. You know, the problem, what you only need landing craft if you don't have a port, because you don't have key sides on which to kind of moor up big ships. But if you've got those key sides, then happy days, and you can just you know, deliver your troops straight in. So the British 1st Airborne Division is dropped in at Taranto on the 9th of, of September, which is Operation Snapstick, with basically without a shot being fired. So, you, you know, it's it's an absolute gimme. And and the Germans, in my opinion, they, they make an absolute catastrophic mistake. You know, they, 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 they're so obsessed with meeting the Salerno invasion that they actually lose sight of what they really need to do, which is protect Foggia. Well, it's interesting because, uh, as you mentioned, Kesselring was uh, Luftwaffe, so he should have been really kind of aware of this. Sorry, yep. you're shaking your head. No, 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 I completely agree. I, mean, oh. <laughs> I was like, I'm yeah, sorry. he really should have been ahead. I mean, you know, Kesselring, broadly speaking, I think gets quite a good press. He's sort of seen as a as a reasonably good German in inverted commas, and uh, you, you know, everyone praises his sort of stoic and 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 hard fought defense of it, southern Italy. But if you give up the most important bit of real estate in the whole of the country, then what's the point of fighting side for Rome? Why, why would you do that? We're by, you know, all that does is just give you extra long lines of communication, which you're going to increasingly struggle to keep when you could just go straight back behind the Pisa Rimini line, as had been suggested by Rommel, who was put in charge of German troops in the north, Wait, and which it, was favoured by, by, by Hitler. I mean, for me, it makes no sense at all. Is it that he was, and, and feel free to correct me if you, if you like, but is it because he was up against Mark Clark? No, who is not no, exactly not the greatest Clark. general of all time. Well, I, I think he, I, I rate Clark very highly, actually. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not a, um, you know, I, I don't really see that Clark does anything wrong at all, to be perfectly honest. Um, so, uh, you know, he's certainly brilliant at Salerno. I mean, you know, he's given an incredibly tough hand. I think Mark Clark, you know, he's, he's last time he's commanded troops in battle had been in 1917, I think, um, uh, or 1918, but certainly on the Western Front in France, you know, he's a brilliant administrator, brilliant planner. But but to go in commanding a, a joint British and American, but it's US Fifth Army, but it's got, you know, a core of British troops in it. Mm -hmm. On your first gig, when you're completely under-resourced in terrain that favours a defender, and when you've got multiple numbers of German divisions that outnumber you, converging on you to counterattack and pull it off, hats off, I reckon. I mean, you know, he he doesn't really put a foot wrong, I would say. I mean, Well, well how does the US 5th and the British 8th actually work together? Do they work together well, they, pretty well? No, not really. Not not in the initial phases, because the problem is, is that, that 8th Army is just too far away to be mutually supporting. You know, you... you, you 
Eighth Army subsequent landing of divisions such as First Airborne and subsequently Seventy Eighth Division and things like this and Fifth Corps. You know, they're on the Adriatic side, and and their job is to primarily get Foggia ASAP. So they're not there to support Salerno. Whereas the two divisions which are landed in a tow, Fifth Division, British Fifth Division, is there to support Salerno. But that's one division. It's got to get three hundred miles through incredibly mountainous terrain where literally every culvert bridge and and mountain pass has been blown up by the Germans. You know, six days is not enough to be mutually supporting, and and nor is it. So, you know, Mark Clark is very much on his own, and that's not his fault, and it's not Monty's fault either. It's just, it's it's the nature of the terrain and the nature of the lack of landing craft, the lack of support for for a very ambitious operation without sufficient support from from the Chiefs of Staff. You know, if if anyone is to blame for, for... the uh, stalling of the Italian campaign that happens in, over the next few months. It is not Alexander, the Army Group commander, or Monty and commanding 8th Army, or even Clark. You know, they don't really put a foot wrong. There's nothing else they can do. You know, you've got... And what does happen is, is they do win at Salerno. I mean, you know, they, Clark oversees the defence of that um, armoured counterattack on the, 13th, on the afternoon of the 13th of September and into the 14th of September, marshals what resources he's got, which frankly are pretty slim at that point, very, very well, stiffens backbone, um, enough extra warships and, and maximum air power is enough to kind of add a bit of fire support, which is much needed to the paucity of troops. And it has to be said, at this point, every single infantry battalion is um, in the front line and and firing, which is a situation which no commander would ever want. You always want reserves. And they pull it off, and and Kesselring signals a retreat behind the Volturno, which is north of Naples, um, you know, sort of 15, 15, 20 miles north of Naples on the morning of the 17th of September, you know, and the crisis has passed. On the 27th of September, Foggia is captured with vast numbers of abandoned Junkers 88s and bombers and fuel and bombs and arsenal and all sorts of stuff. I mean, it, it is absolutely extraordinary. So. The Germans have really, really cocked it up in a, in, in a massive way because suddenly, by the 27th of September, three of the four goals that the Allies have made, getting Italy out of the war, forcing um, Germany to divert lots of resources and troops and getting Foggia, have been achieved. The only thing that hasn't been achieved is the forefame, which is getting to Rome very quickly. And in their way is the Gothic line and a big slogging campaign, so much for the soft underbelly um, of Europe. Yeah, but I mean, I think the the Churchill quote about the soft underbelly has been slightly, um, has been, you know, when when he's saying that, he's saying that in, in, in summer of 1942 and he's trying to persuade the americans that it'll be easier to get a foothold in if in 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 southern mediterranean than it would be across the channel in 1942 and in that he is absolutely 100 percent correct um it's just italy should have been a piece of cake the reason it's not a piece of cake is because they don't have enough shipping to make advantage of the weakness of italy which is its narrowness so you know what you really want to be doing is doing lots of outflanking maneuvers and getting in behind the germans all the time which you could do if you had lots of lots of landing craft. If they'd committed lots of landing craft early on and said, okay, well, we're not going to send so many to the Pacific. Um, we're going to hold fire on Normandy for a little bit longer. We're actually going to launch Normandy in July um, or something like that. Then, you you know, you absolutely would have crushed Italy just like that or got to 50 miles north of Rome without any problem whatsoever. And the whole landscape would have been, it would have been different. But, but, you know, they weren't for budging on Overlord and, and Overlord's the number one priority and that's fine. But then, don't be disappointed when you don't achieve all your aims and you don't get to Rome, because if you're if you're operating in Italy when the terrain is against you, you've got a problem. If you're operating in Italy where you're making the most of its weakness, i.e. its narrowness, then it should be easy peasy. The problem is, is they have to do it the hard way, which is to go across land and work their way up the boot with all its mountains and lack of roads and lack of infrastructure. And, and, and therein lies the problem. And by giving having mission creep, which is to increase the scale of the commitment of strategic forces in Italy once they get Foggia so early on. So the kind of increase of scale of 15th Air Force from six bomb groups to 2021. 20, I mean, that's a massive difference. And to, and to just to, just to emphasise the scale, 
in which we're, we're talking about here. By the 25th of November, a pipeline has been built and constructed capable of transporting 160,000 gallons of high octane fuel every single day from the coast to Foggia. OK, so that 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 can only happen by diverting lots of resources to making it happen. And that can only happen by diverting resources away from the ground troops. So consequently, you know, 5th Army and 8th Army, they're struggling up through this unbelievable terrain, tough terrain, without enough landing craft, without enough support, without enough infantry coming in to, to replace battle casualties. A lot is being expected of them. A lot of it is being expected of the commanders. A lot is being expected of the men who are having to do the fighting. And... And it's pouring with rain. You know, it, it starts raining on the 27th of, of September, the same day that, that Foggia is taken. And it doesn't, it basically starts 50% of the day, so the end of the, of the year, it is raining. And combine heavy rain with heavy numbers of vehicles, all trying to get across roads and routes where they're not designed for that weight, you've got a massive problem on your hand. Uh, and all the all the advantages the Allies have in terms of weight of, of firepower and uh, and air power and mechanization get completely nullified in the quagmire of mud and rain that that hoses down on Italy and everyone underneath it in those dying months of 1943. And what you then get is you get extreme pressure from above. Going, come on, we've got to keep going, we've got to keep going, we can't have a reverse, we can't, you know, we've got to, we said we're going to be in by Rome by Christmas without the material support to make that happen. And it is, it is not the fault of the ground commanders and it is not the fault of the men on the ground. Fantastic. Well, we set it all up for 1944. Uh, Germans are in their winter lines, they're nice and fortified. Obviously, we're going to have Anzio in, in January and things like that. Yeah. But just wrap up the picture where, where do we end 1943 in Italy? So we end up in 1943 with the Allies actually having done pretty well, all things considered. They've got they've broken the Bernhard line, which is the, also known as the Winter Line. It's a major defensive position all across um, southern Italy, which is about sort of 70 miles south of Rome, something like that. But immediately after that is the Gustav Line, um, and, and that's a sort of you know it's only 10 miles further north. And so they've got to kind of battle their way through that. And the problem is, is the Allied way of war has been carefully worked out. You know, it's harnessing mechanization and technology and air power and firepower but it's suited to the traditional summer fighting season rather than the winter but everyone's in a hurry because you know overlords around the corner and you know we, we we can't just have a stagnating front you know this is you know everyone wants to win the war as quickly as possible but they're still not prepared to kind of sacrifice commitments in the pacific or anywhere else to support italy so you know Clark and, and 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 Montgomery get a really and Alexander, who's the army group commander, get get a really bum deal. I mean, they just do. Uh, of course, it's not as bum a deal as the poor sods trying to do the fighting through this. I mean, I remember getting up to Monte Samucro, which is sort of one of the two guardians of the uh, Mignano Gap, which is a sort of narrow route through which Highway Six, the Via Cas ancient Roman Via Caslina, goes from Naples to Rome, and this is the kind of the only main route northwards to Rome from Naples and, and the Allies sort of have to go through it but either side of them standing sentinel, sentinel over the Mignano Gap which is only a kind of few miles you know mile or so wide is Monte Samucro on the right and Monte Camino on the left and these are huge 3,000 feet peaks so what's that you know that's a thousand meters high and you, you know one can climb onto these peaks and, and there, there's no soil of course there's, it's just thin, you know sharp rock I mean imagine fighting up there you know, where, where every mortar round, every artillery round is going to be exaggerated because there's no soil to absorb the explosion. Uh, and, you, and you're anticipating the power of the of the explosion because you're not just getting shards of metal, you're getting shards of stone. And, and you know, when you go up there to this day, you, will, you, you cannot move for bits of shrapnel. I mean, it's, it's literally everywhere. And, and both German troops and American troops or, and British troops uh, and indeed Canadians, we're all fighting there in this absolutely ridiculous scenario. And, and and it's impossible not to be kind of awed by what they achieved because it, it, you, you cannot imagine how they could have done it. And of course, you know, they haven't been trained on this. Germans haven't either. I mean, no one's been trained to kind of operate at a 3,000 foot high mountain. I mean, it's like it's like sort of 
fighting over Scarfell Pike or something. I mean, it's just it's it's just ridiculous. Uh, and so so much is being expected of the men, and and you know, the, the the truth is both sides, both the Germans and the Brit uh, and the Allies, the Western Allies, just get themselves into a massive pickle with Italy because the plans for Italy are all devised in the summer where they're flush of success. The sun is beating down, everything looks twinkly, you know, the wine dark sea, the kind of azure sky, all this kind of stuff. And you kind of think, well, you know, how can it be? This would be a lovely little thing to do. We've got these huge allied forces assembled in the Mediterranean. You know, it's another kind of, you know, nine months until Overlord. You know, we should do something. You can see on paper, it sounds like a great plan. The reality of it is that that both sides, both the Germans and the Allies, are committed to a campaign which is grinding to a halt through the conditions, the privations, the mountains, you know, the fact that wherever you have mountains, you have rivers, and rivers are always trying to get to the sea, which runs at 90 degrees to access of Allied advance, for example. You know, so so it's, it's you know, and, and the, the, the Allied Chiefs of Staff are not prepared to do enough to, 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 to sort the situation out in terms of sort of shipping and supplies. And the German forces simply can't do anything more than they already can because they're also massively stretched. So it just turns into this sort of meat grinding slugfest. Um, and by the end of 1943, the fighting is just absolutely brutal. Well, I'll give you one example of this. So, you know, the sort of the battle for Ortona, which is a town that most people have never even heard of, you know, begins on the evening of the 5th of December and it doesn't end until the 27th of December. You know, as I was saying to you earlier on, you know, most operations in Normandy and Northwest Europe last about five to six days. You know, but this has lasted more than three weeks. And it's just it's just an absolute slaughter for both sides. I mean, you know, in the battles across the River Sangro and up to Ortona, 65th Infantry Division on the German side of things destroyed, gone. 90th Panzer Grenadier Division, gone. Um, First Falschenjäger Division, really, really badly mauled. First Canadian Division just hammered so badly they're not good for action again until you know not proper action until May end of May 1944. You know, so that's what you're dealing with. You know, and and it's just absolutely brutal. And then of course you've got the other problem, which is that that you're in a you know you're fighting for a population of of 40 million Italians, and and you know that firepower heavy approach to war was great in the Western Desert where there was hardly anyone there. But but in Italy, it's a different kettle of fish. And the scale of destruction is just just unbelievable. I mean, of course, most of it's been, not all of it, you know, the the Germans are doing a scorched earth policy as they retreat, um, primarily to make life harder for the Allies because they then have to deal with the fallout for, with the Italians. But a lot of the destruction has also been caused by this firepower heavy approach to war. And... It's Italian, all the Italians that are getting caught up in this, and so the the scale of destruction is 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 just absolutely horrific. And yet, it's the Allies who are supposed to be the good guys. You know, they're 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 supposed to be liberating, and yet they're destroying villages and towns wholesale, and in, in the process of bringing that liberation. So, so the kind of moral conundrum is how much sort of bad do you have to do to achieve good? And and you know, it's it's. The, the moral crusade of the Allies has always been incredibly clear cut, but since arriving in Italy um, and, and, and Sicily before that, it started to get a little bit murky, and it continues to get even murkier <laughs> as as the campaign unfolds. James, I've got to say, number one, it's first of all a pleasure just to have you on. That's, Thank you. That's well, a given. Second of all, I really wish there were more teachers like you at school because. Oh. Because the thing is, I know very little about the Italy campaign, and I've just sat here and actually, I actually want to go out and read the book because I want to know more. You've made it so interesting and so accessible, rather than reading documents from a book and making it extremely boring. So I'm really grateful for that. Number one. Oh, thank you. Could you maybe set up like a bedtime story that I could listen to? <laughs> you know, <laughs> make it a little bit easier. So thank you. Well, um, you know, it's it's a it's a pleasure to come on, and it's a it's a pleasure to kind of sort of burble about all this. I mean, I just I just feel very strongly that the mis the Italian campaign is misunderstood. It's it's a sort of allied black mark. It's it's sort of seen as a bit of a downer. You know, the 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 guys end up being called the D Day Dodgers. Um, everyone's down on Mark Clark. Everyone's down on Monty. Everyone's down on the whole thing. It was a waste of time. It didn't achieve anything. 
the finger pointing that that needs to take place needs to be pointed at the Germans for kind of you know pretty dodgy strategy, frankly, uh, and also towards the Allied chiefs of staff. You know, they're the guys who, who committed without the commitment, um, and I think we just need to kind of you, you know one needs to understand how how this kind of fighting takes place and and how difficult it is in this terrain. And I remember very clearly going to a little mountain village called Ripple Masani, um, which is in the middle of absolutely nowhere. And, you know, and the Canadians fought through this on their way up from the Toe all the way across to the Adriatic and when they launched their attack on Ortona um, in the beginning of December. And, you know, you, you're standing there on this sort of mountaintop, hot, uh, um, you know, which is 600 metres above sea level. And you're just thinking, what the heck? I mean, what are you doing here? This is so mad. And of course, the whole thing is a bit mad. Um, but I think, you know, it's also important not to lose sight of the fact that that within a matter of two weeks or so, or just under three weeks, you know, the Allies had achieved three of the four aims. And they'd certainly achieved the three most important of those four aims. You know, knocking Italy out of the war, drawing off lots of troops, getting the Fodger airfields. So, you know, I don't think one should be too down on the on what what the results are, but I do think it's important also to understand the nature of the fighting in Italy and what it was like. And you know, we've only barely touched on that really, but 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 you know, just just feel for the people that were caught up in it, whether you be an Italian civilian who's in a village which is caught up in the middle of this typhoon of steel as it kind of hurtles way up up the, the leg of Italy, wherever you're a German who's just sort of under resourced and you know part of a penny packet, you know firefighting the whole way through, which is basically what happened, or whether you're allied troops who are kind of flung into this just absolutely horrific um terrain in which to fight and 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 time of year in which to fight I know we're supposed to be finishing and we're taking up a lot of time, but you've literally just switched a light bulb on in my brain where, for example, us sitting in our nice little comfy chairs in 2023 can sit down and look down upon the decisions that these people made. And this happens a lot, especially, for example, in the Warsaw Uprising or in the concentration camps or especially in Polish history, that we can sit here and go, oh, well, you know, well, I would have done this differently. And let's criticise this person for the X, Y and Z decision they made. But they had the information that they had. They were in the situation that we were in that we could never experience or understand. And great, we can sit here and lord all that information over them. But at the end of the day, it is what it is. And it happened. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. And you can only, you know, what you, what you can only do is sort of try and understand what happened. I mean, one of the things that I've I've sort of had a sort of light, mo- light bulb moment on is, is trying not to use... Um, oral histories anymore and, and use contemporary sources and, and I find that much more powerful because of course you know self-evidently if you're talking to someone 60 years after they survived so you're taking out from a dramatic point of view you're taking out the jeopardy of it but the other thing is also what you're getting is you're getting the thoughts of people in the moment you know they don't know when Rome's going to fall or when the war's going to end or indeed if they're going to survive and one of the keys about that is they don't all survive you know you can and the other thing I think is is by following diaries and stuff what you're getting is you're Particularly if you're if you're using a diary, that's because it's it's or letters. It's because they're really really good. You know they're they're articulate and thought provoking and and you know someone's put a lot of time in it. You know I'm not really interested in sort of you know got up got shell went to sleep kind of types. Uh, you know you want something with a bit of detail. And what that gives you is that absolute kind of in the moment, but also a very revealing um, sort of spotlight on that person's character as they were when they were 32 or 21 or 19 or. 25 or whatever age they are and because they're saying they're innermost thoughts their characters really really emerge the things that annoy them the things that get them scratchy the things that make them laugh the kind of interest and all the rest of it and and it's so much easier to empathize with people when they're in the moment than it is when they're kind of talking about something 60 years later where Memories have been kind of infected by kind of sub- subsequent stuff they've read or just re- retrospect or, or whatever it might be. These letters and diaries, they are then, they're on that day in that moment. Um, and I've also tried to use a lot more photographs, you know, particularly if I know the date on which the photograph is taken. You can describe a scene. You're not going to say I'm looking at a photograph and, but you can describe a scene and, and build it around that photograph because that photograph was taken in that split second of that moment on that particular day. And so it doesn't lie, you know, if there's a 
explosion going off in the kind of you know in the Mignano gap it's going off on that moment so all that kind of stuff and it, and it just puts you there in that moment it gives you a different perspective and the other thing I'd say is is that what someone thinks is important when they look back on it 60 years on or 70 years on or whatever it might be is completely different to what people were thinking in the moment on the day um and that just gives you a completely different perspective which I think is just utterly utterly fascinating whether they be German or Canadian or Italian civilian or American or whatever. So it's been it's been fascinating. I think I'm going to sort of stick with that from now on. Fantastic. Well, the book is called The Savage Storm, The Battle for Italy, 1943 by James Holland. James, thank you so much for coming no, along. Thank you very much us. for having me on. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack, or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.